Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Here in the book of Matthew in chapter 18 at verse 22, this was an answer to Peter's question that we find in the previous verse. In verse 21, the Bible tells us that Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Well, first of all, we need to understand some things of the Jewish culture. You see, during that particular time, an individual was expected to forgive one who had sinned against him at least three times. And so you see what Peter did. He said, now, if Andrew sins against me, I'm going to forgive my brother seven times. And so he took the Jewish three, he doubled that, and then he threw one in for good measure. Down south, we call that lanyard. But then we know that the number seven is used figuratively of completeness. And so Peter thought that was sufficient. But the answer that Jesus gives helps us to understand that forgiveness has nothing to do with numbers. And so in order to illustrate that, Jesus goes on to tell this story. And this story is right here in this text in the book of Matthew in chapter 18, beginning at verse 1 with Peter's question and then the answer. And then, of course, we'll pick up there here shortly. What I would like to do, as always, I want to bow and I want to acknowledge my gratitude to Almighty God. I'd like to use the words of the psalmist from the 130th Psalm. Well, that the psalmist says, If you, Lord, would mock iniquities, O Lord, none of us could stand. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. There are so many things that we can be and should be thankful for. Brother Dale offered thanks for so many things in his prayer that we certainly could say amen. And one of the things I am thankful to God for is for the forgiveness of sins. As Ephesians chapter 1 verse says, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, as well as a parallel in Colossians 1 verse 14, the Bible says, in him we have redemption. Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of God's grace. And so with the forgiveness of sins, it allows us a new start, a new life, a new destiny, a new Lord. Everything becomes new, as 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us. And so I'm grateful to God that he allows us to be able to have that relationship with him that we lose when we sin. And so I'm grateful to be with you once again in this final lesson in these series of lessons, Blameless Living. I do want to express my gratitude to this good church. I want to express my gratitude to the elders, your wives who support you, but especially the kind and warm invitation for me to come with my lovely bride, Bessie, to worship and work with you in this special effort. I'm grateful that my daughter, Tanubia, was able to come as well. And I'm grateful for the accommodations that have been made for us. I'm grateful for the encouragement that you have provided for me. I'm grateful for the way that you have treated me. You've treated us. You've treated my lovely bride. And all I have to say, folks, is thank you. I thank God for you. And, of course, I thank God for the wonderful fellowship that we share as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I look in this assembly, and I see all these young people throughout this assembly. And I just got to tell you, young people, you are an encouragement to me. And I appreciate it. And I know you are to other people. Your parents ought to be commended, but you yourselves ought to be commended. And I just want to remind you once again that you are on the right track. And that God has some good things in store for you. And I also want to look, at, I look out in this assembly, and I do see the hoary head. Those older Christians, brothers and sisters, some of you are widows, some of you are widowers. You are an encouragement to me to remind us, just as Brother Dale said, 
to set the proper example so those who follow may walk in the same steps and imitate. And so I'm grateful for all of the examples that are here. I'm grateful for the deacons and your wives who assist you in the special service that you provide to the saints here at West End. And oh, I'm grateful for the hospitality that's been extended. I'm grateful to you, Johnny, and your lovely bride, Chessa. And I'm grateful to you, Dale, and I'm grateful to you, Teresa. And I'm grateful to you, Mike and Stephanie. You are just good people. They're just good people here. I'm grateful for sharing. I'm grateful for the special time we've had together. And we've been able to do that with some of you as well. And just as I said when I first came here, I know that there'll be people that perhaps we know, and then there'll be people that know somebody that we know, and we've made so many connections that we've been able to make throughout our lives. And so I'm glad to be with you in this final lesson, and I want to tell you why I believe this lesson is so important. We're in a series of lessons, Blameless Living. We've taken the statement from the book of Genesis chapter 17 at verse 1 where the, the Lord had said to Abram, he said, Abram, walk before me and be blameless. And we've sort of coined the phrase about walking before God with nothing to hide. And it just makes me wonder how many people are walking before God right now with anger and bitterness and resentment in, his, in their hearts. And I believe that this scripture is going to encourage us to let those feelings go. Because I'm going to tell you what, heaven is worth it. Heaven is worth it. And it doesn't matter what anybody has done to us. It's not worth losing our souls over. So having said that, here is the text. Let's study together. The book of Matthew in chapter 18, Jesus again says to Peter who had asked him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And therefore... You know, the word therefore, now we understand how Jesus is going to illustrate that. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to sell accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to sell accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I don't know how much that is, and I've looked in commentaries, and all I do know is that it is a large sum. And I know this is not really talking about money, but it does remind me sometimes how people get themselves in so much debt. It's almost as if they're living for today. And the Bible tells us we need to be content. In other words, some people are spending money that they don't have. And I know there are things that we do get in debt for, like a mortgage on a house, maybe transportation, if you will, and medical expenses. But I'm talking about people who sometimes they are not very far from the idea of covetousness. I'm talking about the love of money, but not only the love of money, but the things that money can buy. This fellow owed 10,000 talents. It was so large, this is what I do know. He could not pay that back. Look at what the text says. The Bible says... But verse 25, but as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. Listen, men, it's telling us that the decisions that we make in our lives, especially the financial decisions, will have and can have an effect upon our families. And so we need to be wise. We need to go to God and ask wisdom from God. We are just stewards anyway. And ask God for wisdom and how we use the things that God allows us to have. Because they may affect our family, our wives, our children. Notice also what the text says. The Bible goes on to say, The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, 
Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Verse 26. Let me ask you, folks, have you ever been there? Do you know what this is? It's a cry for mercy. You know, oftentimes you see grace and mercy together. One has to do with forgiveness of sin. The other one has to do with relief of consequences. He couldn't pay this back, so he begs for mercy. And then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. Here it is. He released him and forgave him the debt. That's your mercy and that's your grace. But there is something also I don't want you to miss. The Bible said he had compassion. Compassion is one of those words that describe Jesus over and over. Yes, in the book of Acts in chapter 10, the Bible says Jesus was a man who went about doing good. And you know why? Because he had compassion. You know, compassion involves sympathy, feeling sorry for or pity for someone who is of maybe a lower estate or someone going through some difficulties. And then there is empathy. Empathy is putting yourself in somebody else's place. But I'm going to tell you what, compassion goes beyond that. Compassion is sort of like what the Apostle Paul described as having bowels of mercy, being moved on the inside at the unfortunate situation of somebody else. And get this, folks, doing something about it. When you look at all of the signs and wonders that Jesus did, it was because he cared. It was because he really cared. He waited till Lazarus died. He knew he was going to raise him again. And in that I am statement, and of course, in that miracle of raising him back, it demonstrates to us that Jesus has the power to give life. But just like death makes us cry, Jesus knows what it does to us. And the Bible says Jesus wept. You know why? Because he cared. Those tears tell me he cared about that family. Jesus had compassion. And I'm going to tell you what, folks, compassion is lacking in this world today. And the people of God ought to be people of compassion. Feeling the unfortunate situation of others and then doing something about it. And that has a direct reference to spreading the gospel. We're living in a world, folks, where there are a lot of folks who are separated from God. And they need the gospel. And we have it. And we need to have enough compassion so that we can help other people. Now notice what the record says. But that servant went out, verse 28, and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. This is the same fellow now that had been forgiven. And notice verse 29. And compare verse 29 with verse 26. It's almost identical. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. It's a cry for mercy. Just like he cried for mercy. And look at verse 30. And he would not but went and threw him in the prison till he should pay the debt. This is the reason why, folks. This is the reason why people don't obey the gospel. Because they don't want to. This is the reason why people hold on to what's been done to them. Because they don't want to let it go. This is the reason why when people hurt us, people want to get them back. They want them to feel what they've done to them. He would not. Didn't want to. And I want you to notice what the record says. The Bible says, he went and threw him in the prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they, they were very grieved, and rightfully so, and came and told their master all that had been done. And then his master, after he had called him, said to him, 
you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Pause. Now, first of all, this strikes right in the face of Calvinism. This fellow had been forgiven, and now I want you to stop and think. Look at what he's said to be in verse 32. He's said to be wicked. So much for once saved, always saved. So much for the fact that you could be forgiven and never lose your soul. That's just not true. This story is illustrating to us the necessity of recognizing God's willingness to forgive us of our sins. But it's being told in a story from a question that Peter had asked. We could be forgiven now, but you know what? We can find ourselves not under God's grace or God's favor if we also are not willing to have compassion in our hearts and forgive those who do wrong to us. And look at what the record says. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due to him. And so my heavenly father also will do to each of you if you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. This story clearly illustrates is sometimes referred to as the parable of the unforgiven servant, and rightfully so. He had been forgiven of this great sum that he could not pay himself. And then one comes to him and asks for forgiveness, and he refuses because he simply did not want to. And so the king uses him as an example of what will happen if we also refuse to forgive those who sin against us. I think verse 35 needs our attention. When you read this story, why does Jesus say, if you do not forgive from his heart? And I've looked in several translations. In every translation that I looked at, it says, from his heart. And you know what I come up with? Because sometimes forgiveness can be fake. Sometimes people will say, I forgive you, but they really don't. Because sometimes they'll say, I forgive you, and then they wait back and they say things like, oh, I sure hope you get what's coming to you. Or they use things that certainly are contrary to what the Bible says. I hope you get karma. I hope you get what you did to me. Let me tell you what God has to say about that, folks. I want you to look in your Bibles in the book of Proverbs in chapter 17, and I want you to notice very carefully, Proverbs 17, verse 5. God is not pleased when we take pleasure in someone else's misfortune. Look at Proverbs chapter 24, verses 17 and 18. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord sees it and it displease him, and he then turn away his wrath from him. And there's one other that we should be reminded of, and that is Romans 12, 19. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. It's not difficult to understand what's taking place here, but you know what the problem is sometimes? the application of what God is expecting us. Because people hurt us, and sometimes we hurt other people. And we rub one another wrong. You know, this chapter begins, of course, about rubbing one another wrong in a way because the Bible says, woe to the world because of offenses, because offenses must come. But woe to the one by whom the offenses come. And I think that simply means as long as there are people, there are going to be people problems. And he talks about hurting those young, innocent ones. But there's something else I think he says here about trying to resolve these interpersonal problems that we have, specifically among brethren. Because we struggle sometimes with forgiveness, but let me tell you something else. You're familiar with this three-step process Jesus gives dealing with a sinning brother. 
Look at chapter 18. Look at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, you go unto him and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you have gained your brother. That's the goal. You don't go tell somebody else. You go directly to your brother and you talk to your brother with the hopes that you can gain your brother. And hopefully that'll resolve the issue right there. And sometimes it doesn't. And so Jesus said, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Maybe that'll be a deterrent. If you take two or three more, then perhaps you've got somebody else to listen, somebody else's ears, somebody who can help you to reason through that and come to a conclusion or solve any misunderstandings. But you know, sometimes people still are just like the people we were told not to be like last evening. You know, don't be those people who are so selfish. Don't be those people that you can't tell them anything. But notice what he says. The third step. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. What does that mean? Well, obviously, when he talks about the church, he's obviously talking about the local church. You can't tell it to the church universal. And just as Brother Dale talked about, you know, the local autonomy within the church, he's obviously talking about church discipline. And we've got instructions from God in the book of 2 Thessalonians in chapter 3, as well as the book of Romans in chapter 16, verse 17, as well as the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 1. That when a brother or sister refuses to repent, the Bible says withdraw. And of course, you know, that takes care of both collective and individual responsibilities. But sometimes we don't do that either. When a brother sins against us, we should go to our brother. What we're saying, folks, here is when Jesus brings up this issue, he's helping us to understand something that we perhaps all struggle with. If you were asked to list the 10 of the most desirable and admirable human traits, likely even hardened sinners would list a willingness to forgive near the top. Because it is without dispute a mark of maturity and compassion at every level of society. In the home, the business world, the neighborhood, among nations, and certainly within the church. It's one of three kindred traits that are far too seldom seen. One of them is thanksgiving. Another is giving. And of course, the third would be forgiving. And usually where one is found, the others are not very far removed. And not only have we been forgiven, but we have been forgiven that we might forgive. And my slide is not moving. My slide is not moving. My slide is not moving. <laughs> and it moved too fast. I don't I've got a little hang-up with my slide. Can I move back just a little bit? Back. <laughs> there we go, back. One more. Back. <laughs> and we're going forward. Let's hope we can catch up. We have been forgiven that we might forgive. There are two principal words in the Greek New Testament that are translated forgive in the American Standard Version. Now, first of all, there is this word that means literally to send away or to cancel a debt. And I believe that there is something that Jesus said that helps us to be able to understand what we're talking about. I want you to look in your Bible in the book of Matthew in chapter 6. The book of Matthew in chapter 6, and this is the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in the book of John in chapter 17. Prior to his imminent departure, Jesus prayed to the Father after that upper room discourse in John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. And then the Lord's Prayer in its entirety in John in chapter 17. 
But here in the book of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. And when he, when he teaches them how to pray, there is something that Jesus says that we need to recognize as a part of our forgiveness that comes from God. He says specifically in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What that means is as we ask forgiveness from God, we should expect that forgiveness to come from God, understanding that God will forgive us when we forgive other people. Now, again, it's not difficult to understand what Jesus says. The difficulty comes in the application. Look at the very end of the prayer. Look at, I mean, in, at the end of this model, I should say. Look at chapter 6. Look at verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I know there are some difficult things that are in the Bible. As a matter of fact, if you look in Peter's second epistle towards the end, Paul talk, Peter talks about some difficult things that Paul had written about. But this is not one of them. This is an understanding that if we expect forgiveness to come from God, we must be willing to forgive others also. Let me show you how sometimes we struggle with that, and it may even apply to some right now. I want you to go back earlier in this sermon, in the book of Matthew in chapter 5. Jesus is really talking about the heart of the matter. No pun intended. He's talking about the heart of the matter. And what he says here is, sin originates in the heart. And I want you to notice, we're going to just drop right into it. He says, in verse 23, if you bring your gift to the altar and then remember that your brother has something against you, you leave your gift there before the altar, you go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. He says that when we come together, when we come to the assembly and ready to worship God, our hearts are not right if we're holding on to something that my brother has done to him me or something that I have done to my brother. Because if I'm holding on to that, I'm not ready to worship God. And so in our prayers, we ought to pray, Father, forgive me for my sins, even as we forgive others of theirs. And so again, as I said, the difficulty is in the application. And so God is saying, you forgive others and I will forgive you. You don't forgive others, I'm not going to forgive you. And then this word is used figuratively to cancel the debt or the guilt and punishment that is due because of the sins that we have committed. I want you to look at an example, if you will, in the book of Matthew in chapter 9. Look at Matthew in chapter 9. Jesus used this word in addressing the man in Capernaum who was crippled with palsy. Remember the Bible tells us he got into a boat, verse, chapter 9, verse 1, he crossed over, he came to his own city, and then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. You know why they said that, right? Because they know only God can forgive sins. But they missed it. Jesus is deity, and this is the heart of the issue. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is evil, to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk. And so here is the evidence of his deity. Jesus says that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. So who has power to forgive sins? Well, God has power to forgive sins. Jesus has power to forgive sins. And we know that there are things that God can do that we cannot do. But God is the one who instructs us of the necessity that we should recognize and have compassionate hearts and be willing to forgive others who sin against us.
But God is willing to forgive us of our sins, of course, when we meet the conditions of forgiveness. But then there is a word that means literally to bestow a gift or a favor. It's used with reference to God's forgiveness of us. Remember how I began by saying that grace and mercy are oftentimes spoken together? I want you to look in your Bibles with me in the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians in chapter 2, first of all. Colossians in chapter 2, and I want you to notice at verse 12. Colossians chapter 2 at verse 12. The Bible says we are buried with him in baptism, which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God. Now, the Bible is plainly telling us that baptism is a burial. And when we're baptized, baptism is connected with the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, this is my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In the book of Acts in chapter 2, we considered on, on Sunday morning, we talked about the birth of 3,000 babies. When they turned to Peter, they said, Peter, what must we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. But here in the Colossian letter, the apostle Paul is likening circumcision, that Old Testament type, to baptism. Circumcision was a sign that these were God's people. And in like manner, the Bible says, buried with him in baptism, which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, here it is, having forgiven you all trespasses. This is similar to what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans in chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. He likens himself to his own burial in baptism when Ananias came and told him what he needed to do. Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. I'm simply trying to illustrate the forgiveness that comes from God when we meet his conditions. And again, there are things that God can do that obviously we cannot do. But look at what God calls upon us to do, if you will. Look at chapter 3, if you will. Look at verse 12. Here he talks about, and we read this passage the other night, the kind of attitude, the kind of mindset that we need to have once we become Christians, that kind of attitude where we soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We're walking before God with nothing to hide, and God is instructing us on how to do that. But notice very carefully in verse 12, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also, and I know the words italicized, must do. And that's the condition that God has placed. You forgive others, I will forgive you. And But above all these things, he said, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And I want you to go over to the Ephesian letter where the apostle Paul talks extensively about what is called a mystery. Not so much that you cannot know what it is. In fact, Peter said the apostle the prophets were writing about things that they did not understand. But he's simply talking about things that have now been revealed to us. Things that we can know what God was doing back in the Old Testament that had everything to do with the provisions that God was making for our forgiveness. And of course he talks about putting on the new man. And of course this is what God has done. And I think you can see it succinctly in the book of Ephesians in chapter 3 at verse 6. But I want you to notice what God expects of us. Look at Ephesians in chapter 4. I want you to notice Ephesians chapter 4, and I want you to notice at verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Let me ask you, when should we do that? At what point should we do that? When we become Christians and when we understand that we're following the instructions of God, 
and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so what we're learning here, of course, is what the Word of God is teaching us and instructing us about our concern that we have a heart of forgiveness for others. But I want us to notice something else, folks. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke in chapter 17. Luke in chapter 17. It's a parallel to the book of Matthew in chapter 18, where we just studied. Look at Luke in chapter 17. Those first two verses, of course, is a parallel to the earlier verses in the book of Matthew in chapter 18. Jesus says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Now, sometimes there are questions about what if my brother doesn't ask for forgiveness? What if he doesn't repent? Am I still obligated to forgive? Well, I think a similar question can be asked. How long do I hold on to those feelings of anger and resentment? When do I let them go? Back over in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, remember the Bible says in verse 26, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So I take all that the word of God has provided for me. And when someone offends me or someone who hurts me, one of the first things that I'm going to do is I'm going to obviously appeal to the throne of God and ask God for his help to be able to deal with those feelings that I have. Because if I don't, they'll get the best of me. And that having been said, I want to talk about some reasons why people do not forgive if I can go back. No, I'm going forward. Let's talk about some reasons why people do not forgive. And I'm talking about excuses that people sometimes make why they do not forgive. Let me first of all say, an excuse is a reason why people don't do what they're supposed to do. If you look up in a dictionary, a, 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 an excuse is a reason or an explanation to defend or to justify a fault or some offense. And one of the reasons why people don't forgive is because they say, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. And when you stop and think about that, that's backwards. Because we cannot forget until we forgive. And I know that when someone sins against us and they make, they sin against us and we make the decision that we're going to forgive them, we know that our mind's not going to automatically erase that situation because that's not the way that God made us. That's logged inside of our memory. But what do we do when someone does sin against us? What it means is, it means that when we go to God and we ask for God's help, that God will help us to get to a place where those feelings of anger and resentment and bitterness, they don't hurt us anymore. Because if we hold on to those, it's, unforgiveness has been described as the cancer of the soul. And when God made us, he knows that those kinds of feelings, that kind of stress, our bodies cannot handle. Our cardiovascular system, the central nervous system. And what that really means is if we allow the devil, he will do a number on us. And those things can eat us up and keep us from being the kind of people that God wants us to be. Another reason that people give sometimes is because the hurt is too big. Well, that's all the more reason why we should be willing to let that go, to try to resolve whatever the difference is between us and others. The bigger the hurt, the more we need to get rid of that so we can get on with the rest of our lives. And then sometimes people say, well, I don't forgive because time will heal all wounds. I'll just let time pass and it'll get better. 
Well, just because of the passing of a few days on a calendar doesn't mean that that thing is going to go away. We know that there are things that happen in life. Things won't change until some decision is made that it's going to affect it. You know, we have automobiles now with all kinds of technology in it that lets us know when our cars are not working the way they're supposed to work. Don't you love it when that, that light comes on in your automobile, search engine soon? And you know, just because you put a piece of tape over that light, that's not going to solve the problem? Something must be done. Something needs to be addressed. And so when we talk about the forgiveness that comes from God, we're talking about the forgiveness that God expects us to give to others because it is indeed a blessing. And so, not only do we recognize that we have a responsibility, let me help us to understand what it means to forgive. I think, number one, it means that we should have a kind attitude abandoning the animosity and the feelings of anger and wrath and evil speaking, as we've just talked about, to be put away from us. If we would look at the example of our Lord in the book of Luke in chapter 23, remember when Jesus was suspended upon the cross, each one of the gospel accounts give us what happens when Jesus was crucified. But Luke's account gives us some things in detail. And the Bible tells us in the book of Luke in chapter 23, specifically at verse 34, that Jesus says, as he was dying upon the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I think we all understand that they were not forgiven at that point because the forgiveness of God has conditions. But do, when we look in the book of Acts in chapter 2, we know that there were 3,000 souls that were saved on the day of Pentecost. And when those people met the conditions of forgiveness, they were, in fact, forgiven by God. And so there again, there are things that God can do that we cannot do. There are things, of course, that God's conditions of forgiveness, when God tells us to forgive, we must be willing to forgive as well. In the book of Acts, in chapter 7, for instance, do you remember when they were stoning Stephen? And one of the things that Stephen said before he died, he said, Lord, do not hold this charge against them. Now, before Stephen died, he didn't have any animosity in his heart. Acts chapter 7, as well as Acts chapter 8, tells me that there was a young man by the name of Saul who was there. You know when that prayer was answered? That prayer was answered when Saul himself obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ because he provided or he was allowed the instructions on what he needed to do in order to be saved. Ananias came and informed him what he needed to do in order to be saved. Forgiveness involves forgetting at least, at least to the point that when we can, what does it mean to forget? I think again it's impossible for us to erase that from our memory but rather, I think it means to not hold an individual accountable anymore for what they have done towards us. I think it means that we should never dredge it up again. It's kind of like Joseph who forgave his brothers. When Joseph's brothers came to Egypt, Joseph said, God made me forget all the harm that you had done. Well, how did God do that? Because he helped Joseph to remember that God was with him in everything that Joseph did, he prospered. And say, because he turned it over to God. And so he didn't hold that against his brothers. And then number three, forgiveness should be given by the golden rule. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think we all understand that at one time, each one of us have rubbed someone the wrong way. At one time, each one of us has done someone wrong. But yet even more than that, from where we begin, oh Lord, if you would mock iniquities, none of us could stand. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. We've all sinned against God, and he is willing to forgive us, of course, when we meet the terms of forgiveness. But I think God is helping us to be able to understand 
how we can enjoy the blessing that God has provided for us, not only the forgiveness of sins, but how we can live in this life below in our interpersonal relationships that sometimes we struggle with when people harm us and when people do us wrong. And so that having been said, I want to simply close with simply the blessings of forgiveness. Well, first of all, obviously, there is the forgiveness that comes from God when we are willing to forgive others. Another blessing that we receive is when we forgive, it is the release of those negative emotions. We can let those things go. And such things as bitterness and wrath and anger and railing and malice, it possesses the heart of those who are unwilling to forgive. And as I said in the very beginning, losing our souls over what someone has done to us is certainly not worth it. And it's a blessing to the offender when he knows that he has been genuinely forgiven. None of us enjoy living under a cloud of guilt. None of us enjoy the idea of feeling as if we owe someone something because of what we've done to them. And of course, last but not least, if we would practice forgiveness, follow the instructions that God has given to us, it would not only restore relationships, but I think it would also prevent the division that sometimes exists in homes, in communities, in families, and yes, even in churches. And so there are reports almost every day about people and violence, the harm that people do to other people. And yet we have the word of God that teaches us how to live in spite of all of that. Some people feel compelled in retaliating against others who do them wrong. But the people of God, those of us who are striving to live blameless lives, we're striving to walk before God with nothing to hide. That even when someone does harm us, we don't hold on to that bitterness. We don't hold on to that anger. We try to follow the instructions of God. We go to those who sin against us. And of course, when there are those who refuse to repent, then we follow the instructions of the leadership of the local congregation, collectively as well as individually. But yet we live our lives in harmony with the will of God, knowing that all those things that separate us from God, that anger and resentment and bitterness, can keep us from spending an eternity with God. So God expects us to forgive each other. God expects us to take his word and apply it to our lives so that when we hurt or when we've been hurt by others, then we have the willingness to forgive because we follow our Savior and we strive to have the humility that he has demonstrated to us and walk before God with nothing to hide. If you're here tonight and you've never experienced the forgiveness that comes from God, well, know for certainty that God has certain requirements in order for one to be forgiven for his sins. They must hear the gospel, the gospel that God sent his son to be the savior of the world. And he wants men to believe in him, that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, and he died on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and that God raised him from the dead. And if we put our faith in him, just as Paul writes in the book of Romans in chapter 9, if we believe the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And not only that, one must indeed confess Jesus Christ. One must be immersed in water, as we've talked about this evening, for the forgiveness of those sins. And once they come up out of that watery grave, the challenge for each one of us is to live blameless lives. The challenge for you and I is to walk before God with nothing to hide. The challenge for you and I is to live with compassion in our hearts, seeking to help others to be able to find the forgiveness that we ourselves have received from our God who is merciful, the one that we fear, and the one who has instructed us on how to deal with the hurts and the pains that we experience here.
so we can be with him in eternity. If you're a child of God and you're holding on to those things, let him go. The anger, the resentment, all those things, let him go. And approach God on his throne and ask God to help you to deal with those things. And understand how we can indeed live in harmony with one another because God has given us the instructions to do so. If you're here tonight and you need to respond to the invitation, would you please come while together we stand and sing.